This is the Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 177, 15 of the best foods you should be eating. Cool. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie. I run RegainWellness.com and this is the Regain Wellness Podcast. Thanks for coming on out. If you're brand new, extra special welcome. I got a whole lot of shows you could catch up on in the meantime, but this one's going to be about 15 top foods that should appear at some point in your diet. A lot of these actually might be unfamiliar ones too. There'll be some of like the standards, but a few you might not have used or seen and you're not sure what they're all about, so I'll break them all down. So before we start, make sure if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. Shows automatically get sent to you. Yeah, it's all taken care of. Okay, let's do this. So we'll bang to these pretty quick here. And like I said, I'll just I'll go through what I see as well, what a lot of people see as as the top foods that you should include in your diet and why they're so good. So number one, chickpeas. And chickpeas are also known as garbanzo beans. They originally come from the Middle East and the Mediterranean region. The traditional type is round and beige, but you can also find them in varieties that are like black, green, and red, stuff like that. Health-wise, these are one of the best plant-based sources of protein. If you're vegan or vegetarian, they have um, a lot of protein in them. And along with that, they contain a great amount of uh, good carbohydrates, good fiber. So they provide a, like, a real clean and sustained energy. Chickpeas contain a large amount of vitamins and minerals too. And the kind of the combination of all these in them uh, help them to be beneficial in dealing with conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, overall heart health. Uh, chickpeas can also lower cholesterol. They can fight inflammation along with irritable bowel syndrome. Again, that high fiber content, which I'll be referencing a lot through a lot of these foods, is that high fiber is going to make them a great choice for things like weight management as the chickpeas will fill you up a lot and they'll keep you full, but without being high in calories. So the best way though to use things like chickpea, chickpeas is by soaking them for a good eight to 10 hours before cooking and consuming. This is going to make the digestion a little easier. Some people will have problems with some of these things like beans, lentils, chickpeas, or whatever, uh, depending if you have issues with what they call FODMAPs, which are various forms of carbohydrates, like short chain carbohydrates and uh, natural sugar alcohols. They, they just cause you know digestive issues, cramping, bloating, all those sort of things. But when you soak these things, it releases more of those digestive enzymes and makes them easier to digest and process. Okay, the next one, number two, pumpkin. So obviously usually associated with the fall or Halloween, pumpkin is actually a very nutritious plant. And it's not just in the form of pumpkin, pumpkin spice latte based everything that comes around during the fall. It's versatile. It can be used in a lot of dishes like soups, obviously salads, uh, desserts, preserves. You can even use it as a butter substitute if you want to play around with that. And pumpkin's very nutrient dense, but also low in calories. So it makes it a great choice for anyone, again, looking to lose weight, but not neglect nutrition. Health wise, pumpkin's high in potassium and that's good for helping lowering blood pressure. It's also high in antioxidants, so that's going to help the body fight off free radical damage. Uh, it's going to help prevent degenerative eye disease. And, and probably most known, pumpkin's rich in beta carotene, and that can help reduce the risk of certain cancers. It can protect against asthma, can combat heart disease altogether. I don't mean it'll get rid of all heart disease. It's just all those different um, conditions it helps with. So pumpkin is best when consumed in its natural form. I mean, you don't want to get it in like canned pumpkin pie mixes and all that crap, which is higher in sugar and preservatives and whatever. So pumpkin though will last for a good two months though when stored in a cool, dark place like me. So it's again, versatile and doesn't have to just be used, um, you know, during the fall. Okay. Peas. Number three, peas are not technically a vegetable, but they're part of the legume family. And they're an easy food to include in the diet. You can get them fresh, frozen, however, you know, however you like them. Peas are also low on the glycemic index at a very low 39, 
which is how, you know, our body, it's the way we rate food. If you don't know glycemic index, it's the way we rate food to show what an impact it has on like our blood sugar level. So the higher the number, the more intense it is. And ideally something you want to stay away from, you know, at the top is like, you know, sugars and um, glucose and corn syrups and stuff like that. This is down low. So it makes a good choice for people who are diabetic or who have blood sugar issues. Peas also contain a good amount of fiber, which again, you know, fiber is more than just keeping you regular, but it helps to balance out things like your blood glucose levels. It's slower digesting. The fiber in peas improves gut health and they, they're filling, but again, a low calorie option. So peas also contain a lot of antioxidants, which give them a lot of their health benefits. So they'll help with digestion. They may help protect against certain cancers, uh, heart disease, diabetes, things like that. And then peas can be easily added into soups, salads, cook dishes. They're very high amount of protein, actually. And that's why you see a lot of um, you know, vegan or vegetarian based protein powders are used. There are a lot of pea protein based because it's a good high protein source. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, that's a good way to get extra protein in your diet. They are not a complete protein, however, and they do, uh, they don't contain all the amino acids. So they do better when they're paired with things like beans, uh, like the chickpeas I mentioned before, just to get that full range of amino acids. Okay. The next one is fatty fish and the fatty fish choices are things like trout, salmon, mackerel, sardines, eel, herring, tuna. These are one of the healthiest foods out there. And even though it's higher fat, it's a natural oil content. It's what keeps their body temperature regulated in colder waters. And it, that means they have a high omega-3 fatty acid content, also high in protein. And omega-3s are seen to reduce inflammation in the body. So it's they come in the form of that polyunsaturated fat, which is the very beneficial kind that you want as far as helping lowering the risk of heart disease, cancer, even arthritis and stuff like that. These fatty fishes are beneficial for cognitive function as the, um, the omega-3, like the polyunsaturated fats in them are in the form of EPA and DHA, which I don't even try to pronounce anymore because... I sprain my tongue most of the time. So these EPA and DHA fatty acids, they're the things that help combat against the cognitive issues like Alzheimer's or dementia. They help in memory and, you know, all that sort of thing. And the high, again, related to cognitive issues, that high omega-3 content can also help with depression um, and learning and all that sort of thing. So again, the best choices for these fish are, are going to come from verified sustainable fisheries. So you know you're getting the cleanest choices possible. If you can find them locally, that's awesome. Ideally, you get at least two servings of, of fish per week. And one serving is going to equal around three and a half ounces. So if you can get a couple of those a week, it's going to be very helpful health-wise. Okay, next food seeds. And it, this covers quite a bit. Um, there's several types of seeds that are very beneficial to health. So some notable ones, pumpkin, chia, flax seed, pomegranate seed, sunflower seed, sesame seeds, hemp seed. These, especially these ones, or specifically these ones, contain all the necessary starting materials to turn into plants. You know, you forget like these things are going to grow into plants. That's what makes them so nutritious is everything is right there in the seed. So they're a great source of fiber. They're a great source of protein. They're filled with monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals. So all those compounds in there can help in, you know, things like reducing blood sugar, lowering cholesterol, lowering blood pressure. The choices like flax or chia, they contain the omega-3 fatty acids, not as in good a concentration that you would find them in, say, like the fish, but still going to have some in there, which again will help you know combat inflammation in the body and may prevent some diseases and condition conditions. Uh, the seeds are also high in antioxidant polyphenols, so that you know that's the free radical damage in the body that you want to avoid, which includes when the, when the free radicals damage happens, it includes DNA damage, premature aging, all that sort of thing. So that high antioxidant content in the seeds will help. Seeds also contain good protein and choices like hemp seeds 
are one of the few plant sources that are complete protein that contains all those amino acids. So seeds are great because they're very versatile. They can be added into you know anything, salads, baking, many other dishes. They're an easy snack. You can take them anywhere on the go. I eat sesame seeds and sunflower seeds all the time. Like I'll mix them together with some like walnuts and almonds. It's a perfect snack. Okay, next food you should be eating fermented foods. So the, this is a whole giant topic on its own, but I'll try and go over it quick. So fermented foods are the ones that are full of the probiotics, which help to balance the good bacteria in your gut. So with the proper balance, a healthy gut can reduce inflammation. It can promote better digestion and protect against many diseases. So a healthy gut also leads to better cognitive function and better mood as two thirds, like we're now seeing the gut as actually being a second brain in the body and two thirds of the neurotransmitters in the body. Like think about those feel good hormones like ser- serotonin and endorphins. Two thirds of those are made in the gut. And if your gut bacteria is out of whack, it can affect things like mood and well being and everything like that. So the fermented foods are things like kombucha, kefir, kimchi, miso, sauerkraut, pickles, tempa. They're very inexpensive. They're easy to incorporate in the diet as well too. So fermented foods also have the benefit of controlling sugar cravings as when your gut bacteria is out of whack and you have too much bad gut bacteria, it actually really feeds on sugar and that can cause you to crave more sugar. It's not even like you wanting it specifically. It's your gut wanting it. Like I said, your gut's like your second brain and it's wanting that sugar and it's hard to actually fight that. Some other fermented foods, such as like the miso, is rich in antioxidants, B vitamins, all that beneficial bacteria. The fermented foods work well if you've had to take a dose of antibiotics because they can help uh, balance things out because you're killing off, you know, the bad bacteria, but you end up killing off a lot of the good bacteria with the antibiotics. So fermented foods can help restore that. Uh, they, The probiotic content in them can also improve glycemic control in the body and again beneficial for you know things like diabetes management and so forth okay the next food i don't even know what we're on here seven six oats so you know oats are commonly eaten in the form of rolled oats and oatmeal you can have them in porridge cookies oat cakes oat bran one of the best sources of soluble fiber out there and you know hold their place as a very good health food Health benefit wise, they're top, they're probably one of the top choices for reducing cholesterol as the cholesterol can bind to the soluble fiber in it and then be excreted by the body. So when we talk about soluble fiber, it's something that kind of secretes out a gel when it gets wet, you know, like how oatmeal does when you cook it in water and it gets more viscous. Or if you've had chia seeds before and you know if they get wet um, or you soak them they they get like this sort of gel like secretion around them that's what's binding uh, things like the cholesterol to it to get rid of it uh, through the body and again a high fiber content it makes it easier on blood glucose levels helps to keep you full and is a cleaner energy source you can have um Actually, there's a lot of research showing how oats can fight against things like colorectal cancer and may also help lower blood pressure too. So they're also full of vitamins, minerals. They include a lot of things like thymine, manganese, magnesium, iron. Again, they're cheap. They're easy to use. They're a great breakfast option and an easy way to keep your body healthy. Okay, next food, beans and lentils. So Combining these together, beans are technically seeds that come from, um, you know, family of of plants that are commonly known as like beans, peas, legumes. They they kind of all fall under the same umbrella, like lentils as well. Like it's kind of confusing. Like lentils are kind of legumes as like the way peanuts are legumes. Like they're not a nut, but there's kind of some weird crossovers there. But basically... Beans, if we sum them up like that, make for, again, another inexpensive but very healthy option. And to get, you know, things like protein, fiber, vitamins, and get some other health benefits with it. So so the top bean and lentil choices will be things like black beans, lima beans, garbanzo beans, soybeans, kidney beans, black-eyed peas, not the horrific band that ruined music, 
navy beans, pinto beans, red beans are good too. They're all very nutrient dense. They're very high in folate. And with something like folate, when your folate levels are low, you can experience symptoms like weakness and fatigue or maybe loss of appetite, sometimes like heart palpitations, uh, irritability. You know, So folate is one of the best sources are going to be these beans. Beans are also a great source of zinc, iron, magnesium, uh, fiber. Obviously, the fiber from them is going to, again, help with those blood sugar levels, lower glucose levels. Good for you know diabetics. The fiber helps with the gut health. They they're another very sustaining food that's going to help keep you full and feeling full. Okay, next food is going to be bananas, and bananas are one of the, like the most perfect portable snacks for you know quick energy and nutrition. One of the most widely consumed foods on earth, and they can be eaten alone. They can be added into things like smoothies, breakfast cereals. Rich in potassium, that's one of the main reasons a lot of people like them. So the potassium helps in maintaining uh, fluid levels in the body and regulates the movement of nutrients and waste products in and out of the cells. The potassium is also important in helping muscles to contract and nerve cells to respond. It's also involved with helping the heartbeat regularly and can reduce the effect of sodium on blood pressure. So if you're getting too much sodium, if you need to keep them down, potassium can help you know, regulate things a little, little better. Bananas also contain fiber. They may help prevent asthma, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Uh, storage wise, this is just a side tip. Storage wise, you notice bananas can get ripe pretty quick. It's actually best to keep bananas away from other fruit as they emit a gas called ethylene, which speeds up the ripening in other fruits. And then also the, the bananas themselves. If you separate the bananas from the bunch, it'll help them not to ripen as fast. You know, bananas seem to go from like not good, not good, not good, can't eat them. Like it's just immediately like they can turn brown. So keep them away from other fruits and separate them from the bunch. And that's just going to help extend their life a little bit more. Okay, next top food, citrus fruits. So when you think of citrus fr- fruits, you're probably associating them associating them with immune boosting properties Uh, like so we're talking about things like oranges lemons tangerines limes grapefruit rich in vitamin c they're what a lot of people turn to to combat colds and flus but they also have other health benefits and they're an awesome easy snack to add to the diet so citrus fruits good source of fiber Uh, they're filled with flavonoids which help protect for heart health Citrus fruit contains a lot of soluble fiber. Again, will help with the lowering of cholesterol while also being lower in natural fruit sugar so they can help regulate blood glucose. I mean, all fruit is pretty much good. It's a whole, again, another side topic. If you have to be really careful with sugars, you want to be careful with the overly sweet things like mangoes or papaya or, or whatever. But the citrus fruits contain lower amounts of natural fruit sugars. And again, that higher fiber content gives them that lower glycemic index, uh, the fiber, again, helping keep you reg- regular and all those other good benefits. The vitamin C content, it's, it's not going to prevent colds per se, but it's going to help make the symptoms less severe and last a shorter amount of time. The, um, again, citrus fruits also contain a lot of, contain a lot of potassium and may help your body by allowing it to better absorb nutrients from other foods. So that like things, especially like lemons and limes help your body in that way. So again, a quick, easy, portable snack. Next top food, sweet potatoes. I eat sweet potatoes, honestly, every day, pretty much. They're a healthier alternative. Not the regular potatoes are bad, but they're a bit, a bit better choice there. And despite any confusion, they're not related to yams. It's a whole different sort of thing. And that even though they contain technically more natural sugar than a regular potato, they're still full of fiber and potassium and have less calories. So a medium-sized baked sweet potato with the skin, which is, has a lot of the fiber content, contains just around 100 calories. So a good addition to the diet. So sweet potatoes, again, even though it's that natural form of starchy sugar, they're lower on the glycemic index. Again, can help lower blood sugar. Um, it's good for insulin resistance in people with diabetes. It's another great high fiber item. So it helps in, again, lowering cholesterol, lowering blood pressure. The high fiber content is also good if you have constipation or, and it promotes regularity and it leads to a healthy digestive tract, 
the sweet potatoes, they're high in choline, which is a nutrient that's very important with things like sleep, memory, learning, muscle movement, all that sort of thing. And they're also high in vitamin A, C, E, tons of antioxidants in sweet potatoes, beta carotene. Um, that's you know obviously important for vision and things like that. So you can use them a lot of ways. They can be baked in the oven. That's going to actually elevate the natural sugar content a little more than other cooking pre- preparations. It kind of like crystallizes when it turns it a little more, I don't even know how this, mushy is not the right word, soft, is that better? Uh, that elevates the sugar content a bit, just if you're trying to be careful. If you dice them up though and saute them with olive oil, that might keep that a little more um, lower. You can even cook them in the microwave. Okay, next one, one you might not expect to see, uh, cayenne pepper. So cayenne pepper is a hot chili pepper that's part of the capsicum family. You know, they're originated from Central South America, actually named after the city of Cayenne. So cayenne pepper has been a part of our diets, especially like Native American cuisines for 9,000 plus years. Uh, Easy to add to dishes to enhance flavor, but filled with a ton of health benefits, primarily due to the main ingredient in them, which is, I never know how to say it, capsaicin. And that's what I'm going with. So you'll have to deal with it. So that's what's giving the that's what gives the spiciness uh, to whether it's the real form or the powder, but it's this is effective. Um, cayenne pepper is effective at treating aches and pains from muscles and and joints and stuff like that. Also filled with vitamin C, B six, vitamin E, potassium, manganese. So besides promoting pain relief, cayenne pepper is good for helping burn calories. Uh, it's, it increases metabolism. It's good as an appetite suppressant. Um, can be good. You can use it as a home remedy to help relieve congestion again, because of, um, that higher, like in, enhancing, like the body temperature can treat coughs and colds. It's, it's very low calorie, almost like nothing. And goes well with, you know, eggs, soups, tacos, pasta, whatever. I use cayenne pepper all the time. Okay. Next food, dark chocolate. And I've covered this a lot again on the show, but dark chocolate is a great way to relieve some of those sugar cravings while still providing some health benefits. So dark chocolate is made from the cacao plant and it differs from commercial chocolate, which, you know, contains sugar and cocoa butter and milk. And those commercial chocolates are basically like chocolate flavored sugar is probably the best way to look at them. Dark chocolate has higher concentrations of cacao and the healthiest choices should have at least 70% cacao salts, but ideally more. I eat like 90%. I'll do the odd, like I've tried the 100. It's intense, but it's worth giving a shot. And the big draw with the dark chocolate, especially with the higher cacao salts, is its antioxidant content. And besi- besides preventing oxidative stress in the body, the dark chocolate can help with heart disease, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, certain cancers, the dark chocolate is full of flavanols and these help to stimulate what they call nitric oxidant oxide in the body. And that helps lower your blood pressure. And it's also full of polyphenols, which are important in helping lower your bad LDL cholesterol while actually raising your good HDL cholesterol. So dark chocolate is actually made of primarily healthy fat. So it's really low in sugar and the glycemic index. So it is still calorie dense though, But if you're going for just, you know, 20, 30 grams a day, it's seen as really a good healthy snack. Um, And again, it can help with any sugar cravings and stuff like that. Okay, next choice, next top food, black rice. So this might be a new one for you, but this black rice goes all the way back to ancient China. And it was consumed by Chinese kinsmen who thought it improved the health of the kidneys and the stomach and the liver. It became something used by the elite mainly, the elite and the wealthy, and it was a harder thing to come by. And it was also known as the forbidden rice for a while. Uh, It's mainly grown in the northeast and southern parts of India these days. So it's, you know, black rice is very rich in antioxidants and it's, it gets that deep color as an indicator of the antioxidants. Same way with like the dark color of blueberries, like the darker blue purple you can get, the better. So black rice is rich in the antioxidant called uh, anthocyanin, anthocyanin, and it has the highest amounts of this of any rice or grain out there. 
So that is very important in fighting cardiovascular disease, along with helping improve brain function, lowering inflammation. It's full of phytonutrients that can help cleanse the body of toxins. It aids the liver in doing all this at the same time. Amazing food, this black rice. It has plenty of fiber, a good choice in preventing risk of diabetes and blood sugar issues. It's rich in protein, tons of iron. It's a great choice for vegetarians and vegans. Okay, let's finish. Here's the last one, and it might be a little newer to you, or you not you might not know of it, and that is bulgur. So this is a whole grain wheat that's popular in traditional Middle Eastern dishes. It's a cereal grain, and it's easy to prepare, but comes with a lot of great health benefits. So it's made from dried cracked wheat, and most commonly from durum wheat. So it tends to be parboiled or sort of partially cooked, so then you can prepare it easy after. And when it's cooked, it's going to have a similar texture to like quinoa or maybe like couscous. It's considered a whole grain and that the entire wheat kernel, like the, the germ, the endosperm, the bran, are all eaten with it. So it's that makes it a minimally processed grain, which means it retains the majority of its nutrition. So it's high in vitamins, minerals, fiber, while being lower in calories compared to other grains. So it's high in manganese, magnesium, iron, uh, promotes heart health. Uh, since it's a, again, another high fiber whole grain, it's good for controlling blood glucose. It supports healthy blood sugar control. Bulgur can also promote the growth of healthy gut bacteria and also aids in digestion while being able to fight constipation. So you can find it in various forms, like, uh, like in a fine, medium or coarse grain. Uh, and usually if it's parboiled, par, parboiled, it'll only take around, you know, five to 20 minutes to cook, depending on the coarseness. It's kind of like cooking rice and that you need it to absorb the water. And if you are cooking it, you want one part bulgur. Um, with that, you'll need two parts of water. Okay, let's slap a bow on this puppy and wrap it up here. Hopefully, there's a lot you can take away from that. Some new foods, um, some ones you maybe sort of forgotten about, but all amazing additions to the diet. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Again, if you haven't already, subscribe wherever you get your podcast. I should be there, and I will see you soon. Bye.